Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, if you saw the talk I did on deep learning, shallow learning, you know, a year ago, this will be as different as possible from, from that talk. Uh, and this is very much new work. It's a work in progress. So if you see connections with your own work, if you have ideas for directions that we should take this, you know, I encourage you to, to get in touch with me. Um, okay, so this is joint work with uh, Yin Lu was a grad student who I worked with at Cornell. Johannes used to be at Cornell, but we've managed to steal Johannes, and now he's in Redmond as well. Uh, and then this is a, a dev at uh, MSR in Redmond, and Mark Sturm uh, is a, a tech employee uh, at a major hospital uh, whose name we can't divulge. So, <laughs> and I just want to thank uh, the medical experts who have helped us with this. Uh, Greg Cooper, Mike Fine, and Eric Horvitz has also helped us. Uh, and then these are other collaborators on some of the papers. Um, we've published a few KDD papers and what I'm gonna talk about. The KDD papers are kind of technical. You, you know, they're the usual computer science. Uh, here's the detailed algorithm. Here's why it's 100 times faster and still as good as other things. Uh, this is not gonna be that kind of talk. This is gonna be a very untechnical sort of demonstration of what you can do with the methods. And I'm actually gonna spend only sort of one or two slides uh, telling you about the machinery that's behind the scenes. Um, okay, so, uh, and the motivating example for me is gonna be healthcare. Uh, so although you can, can use this for other things. Um, so let me just sort of give you a thought experiment. So you've got uh, a lot of data, you know, million, 10 million patients. You've got say thousands of good features for each of those patients. Uh, you're very good at machine learning. You've trained a state-of-the-art model uh, on the data. And, you know, the accuracy of the ROC just looks phenomenal. You know, ROC 0.95. We never get that in healthcare data, but imagine that you, you do something that good. So now I guess the question is, you know, is it really safe to go ahead? I, I mean, the model looks great, and the data was great. Uh, is it really safe to go ahead and deploy this model and start using it on real patients? Is high accuracy on test data is that sort of sufficient to say that it's safe to use this model? I mean, you know, what, what could go wrong, right? right. You, you, you know, it's, it's the ideal setting for machine learning. Well, what have you really got? So what you've really got is this black box. Uh, maybe this model is boosted trees or a deep neural net or a random forest. You've got this black box. You've got incredibly high ROC on it, on a test set, so, so that's great but you don't actually understand what's in the black box. And I'm gonna talk for a while, give you some motivation to understand why high accuracy on test data is not sufficient in, in critical applications like healthcare for, for fielding a model. And that you have to be able to do much more than, than just get high accuracy. So let me tell you, I was involved in a study, this is back when I was a grad student at CMU, uh, it was a multi-institutional study. Um, so in fact, Greg Cooper, who was a, uh, he went to grad school with uh, Eric Horvitz and David Heckerman, so these guys all know each other from back then. Greg Cooper was in charge of the study, and uh, our goal was to compare different learning methods that were available in the mid-90s, um, so deep learning didn't exist yet, uh, to compare these different learning methods on this pneumonia prediction task. And we had the usual kind of learning-based methods back then. Uh, you know, we had rule-based learning back then. We don't use that very much these days. Uh, but we had that. We had simple neural nets, you know, one layer. We had some Bayesian methods. Hierarchical mixture of experts was a new method at the time. And our goal was to compare these different learning methods and see how well they could do compared to, say, logistic regression, you know, the, the good old standard uh, learning method that's used in healthcare so much. Um, and, you know, things like SVMs were just sort of happening. They weren't really available yet, to, so, so we don't get to compare against those things. Uh, and I got very lucky. Uh, although there were a dozen different teams competing on this data set, the multitask uh, neural net that I ended up training ended up being the best model of all the different models. It had the highest ROC, the highest accuracies, things like that. Um, so you might think uh, we would then, you know, maybe go to clinical trial with this neural net. Um, and we were discussing doing that, and I actually stopped them from going to clinical trial with the neural net. Uh, and instead, we ended up 
uh, doing further experiments with logistic regression. We, we didn't use the neural net. In fact, we used uh, one of the poorest performing learning methods uh, for future work as opposed to the highest accuracy model. So now the question is, well, why do we do that? Right? Obviously, it's going to have something to do with the intelligibility or lack of intelligibility of the neural net. But let me give you more detail about, about what happened. So the goal of this uh, experimental work that we were doing was to train a model that would predict your risk of, say, dying from pneumonia or from something very bad happening, like you, you end up you know, needing a lung assist or, or you end up in cardiac failure or something like that. So a really bad outcome, basically, from pneumonia. Think of it as probability of death. So that's our goal, is to predict whether you all have pneumonia. Uh, we already know that diagnosis. Our goal is just to figure out which of you are high risk, because then we should admit you to the hospital. And if you're low risk, in fact, the proper care is uh, chicken soup, antibiotics, and uh, call us in three days if you're not feeling better. That, that actually is the best care for you if you have pneumonia and you're not you know, very high risk. You don't want to go to the hospital unless you really have to. So, so OK, so we're trying to train a model to decide whether you're a high risk or a low risk patient so we can decide whether to put you in the hospital or not. Um, and the guy who was doing the rule-based learning learned a rule one night, which, uh, which was if you have asthma, it lowers your chance of dying from pneumonia. Right? And you, you, you don't have to know a lot of medicine to question <laughs> whether that makes sense. So of course, we went to the next you know, huge meeting with, with the doctors. Uh, and we asked them about this. And they said, oh, that's, that's interesting. They, they said, in the data that, that we're playing with, uh, we consider asthma to be a very serious risk factor. If a patient with a history of asthma presents with pneumonia, they not only go into the hospital, you know, they often went into the ICU back in the mid-90s. They went into critical care. They received very, very aggressive, careful treatment because they're considered very high risk. And the good news is that that treatment is so effective uh, that it actually lowers their chance of dying compared to the other pneumonia patients who don't receive that aggressive treatment. So, you know, chalk one up for, for healthcare, right? They're doing something great for high-risk patients. They're, they're saving them. Uh, so it is a true pattern in the data, right? I mean, I, I mean, it is true that the asthmatics in the data set actually have a higher chance of living than non-asthmatics in the, in the data set. So it is a true pattern. The rule-based system learned it. I can only assume that anything the rule-based system could learn, the neural net would have learned. So we assume that this is also in the neural net. It's a real pattern in the data. There's no reason why the neural net wouldn't learn it. I'm a smart guy. I, I told them, hey, you know, I can probably figure out a way to make this problem go away in the neural net. So, so I can probably fix this problem. And there are different ways that you might try doing it. It's actually not so easy. It would, it would take research and publishing new papers, which is you know, a good thing, actually, <laughs> for us. Um, but that's not what made me say we should not use this model on real patients. This is what scared me was, I'm just going to make up a story. Our data actually doesn't have any pregnant women in it. But, Imagine that uh, a pregnant woman who has pneumonia also receives very careful attention and treatment, and then that makes her also less likely to die from pneumonia. Also, there's selection bias. Pregnant women would tend to be younger patients who have a much better chance of surviving pneumonia. So you could imagine that pregnant women also uh, would have a lower probability of death because of the treatment that they would receive. Uh, and maybe the neural net is predicting lower risk for pregnant women, uh, but the rule-based system didn't learn it. So now there's this problem like, well, I don't know what the neural net learned that the rule-based system didn't learn, so I don't know what I need to fix in the neural net you know, that something else didn't learn and tell me about. And that's why I stopped them from further consideration of using the model on real patients was I said, you know, we don't understand this model. It's, it's a, one of the most complicated models people would train sort of in the mid-90s. Uh, and I said, we just don't know what harm it might do to certain classes of patients. We already know it's making a big mistake on asthmatics. Maybe it's making big mistakes on other patients and we just don't know about it. Let's not use it. So, and that's why we ended up using logistic regression. Logistic regression, it's very easy to read and understand the model. Okay, so. So that's the big problem. I mean, maybe we just can't use some of the most accurate learning methods in healthcare uh, because 
because we're just not going to be able to understand them. Maybe we're going to be stuck with using standard tried and true methods like logistic regression for these sort of critical apps because it's very, very important. Like you might think, oh, well, you really should just collect better data, right? You, you, should, not, you should collect a data set where you don't send the asthmatics in for treatment. Right? And then you'll realize that asthmatics really are higher risk, and, and then you'll, in the future, do the right thing. Of course, that's not ethical. Right? We, we can't withhold care from, from asthmatics in order to train a better machine learning model here. Um, so, so, so we have this problem. You, you know, it's not easy to know what the model has learned that's bad. We can't sort of collect the ideal data because we have to live with the data that's actually available to us where treatment is already being done. So, so we're just in this sort of conundrum. Maybe we're just going to have to stick with models that are just very simple, even though they're less accurate. And what I'm going to hopefully show you is that we can actually get models that are much more accurate than logistic regression, um, but we can get a lot of intelligibility out of them. So, so that's where we're going. OK, so you know, maybe there's this sort of trade-off, right? Models can be low complexity, high intelligibility, unfortunately low accuracy, or the trade-off can run the other way. We can have high complexity, high accuracy, but at the expense of intelligibility. And if you think about it, you know, maybe it's something like, maybe it's a very fundamental thing, like Planck's constant, right? You, you can't know uh, an electron's uh, momentum and position accurately at the same time. Uh, maybe you can't have high accuracy and high intelligibility at the same time. And hopefully we'll, we'll see that actually this isn't true. That, that it's not going to be like this. Uh, yeah. What in your previous discussion had anything to do with intelligibility? It sounded like you were really talking about interventions and causality, not intelligibility. Right. So, so there's no doubt that uh, being able to train causal models would be the ultimate cure for this problem. Uh, if we had truly causal models, then it would recognize that it was the intervention the asthmatics was re were receiving that made them low risk and that without that intervention, they would be high risk. Um, causal learning, of course, is very difficult. And I don't know how we would even do the causal learning without withholding the treatment from some asthmatics to understand what the effect of them not receiving treatment would have been. Uh, so, so that's a bit of a problem. So but there's no doubt if we could do causality, that would solve the problem. But, but I'm just going to assume that causality is too hard for us to do. And then intelligibility. I think of the rule-based system as having been intelligible. That is, we could immediately see there was a rule, asthma lowers risk. We immediately questioned whether that rule made any sense. And then it's very easy in the rule-based system to eliminate that rule, to just. Are you, are you applying causal reasoning to make that deduction? Uh, certainly when we want a model to be accurate, the ultimate most accurate model would be something that's causal. But it's not necessarily the case that you have to be causal to be accurate. I mean, the way you concluded that the, that the asthma rule was bad was from your understanding of causality. Oh, oh yes, ab absolutely. We're using medical expertise and, and their causal understanding to, to conclude it. Oh, oh, there's no doubt about it, yes. And I assume that this will be true in many uses of machine learning, both in healthcare and in other applications, where we'll have background knowledge, which would let us look at a model if we could understand it, and say, good, 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 huh, that's interesting, I didn't know that. Good, oh, oh, that looks wrong. Let's get rid of that. That 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 that's bad. But what I'm, getting, my, what, I'm, what I'm getting to is that if you actually have this causal information, why not just use that causal information directly instead of? Well, it's it? awfully hard to write down all the causal information you know beforehand, right? I mean, but you it's, elicited it from the expert, right? As soon uh, as you the, showed them that rule and they said it was wrong. The, there's a big difference though between looking at the model, seeing what it's doing, and having an expert say, "Oh, oh, that looks questionable," and doing the opposite, which is saying. Expert, please spend the next five years writing down everything you understand causally about the world. A experts can't do that. That's sort of a, an artificial extreme you've made there. Uh, but that was a plan I, in the 80s. It didn't work. Right. I, 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 I think it is. I think he's, he's making it far too extreme, right? And he's making it into a straw man, basically. That's not what I'm saying at all. Yeah, I, I think it's much. Yeah, I, I think you'll see when you look at the models. It's much easier for an expert to check a model to look at it and see if it makes sense or not, then it would be for an expert to explicitly elicit all of the, what they know in advance, especially since the majority of it's probably not relevant to the model. The, the, the alternative yeah. you're describing is not what I'm suggesting at all. I'm Sorry, I, I must be misunderstanding. <laughs> Should we let okay. page continue? And yeah. you will be here for lunch and in yeah. the afternoon. So I, I'd be happy to talk about this more this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. I mean, 
The causal step is something we're thinking seriously about, but it's fraught with challenges. So, so we don't know how to go that way yet. OK. So let me just talk a little bit about model complexity um, to sort of show you the space of models that we're going to think about. So here's good old linear regression and logistic regression. These are sort of pretty intelligible models for the most part. I mean, in very high dimensions, of course, everything gets complicated. Um, but basically, we just have sort of weights times individual features. Uh, and we can look at those weights, and if the weight is positive, it you know, increases risk. If it's negative, it decreases risk. If it's zero, the term isn't in the model. So these are pretty intelligible uh, things, if the features are intelligible, of course. If the features are not intelligible, then, then all is lost. Um, so this is sort of simple, uh, reasonably intelligible if the dimensionality is not too high. Um, but unfortunately, they're not always that accurate. Um, so now we've got much more complicated things like deep learning, random forests, boosted trees, you, you know, all these sort of new methods that we've developed in machine learning over the last 15 years. Uh, and these things are, are much more accurate, typically, uh, on most data sets. But sadly, they're, they're pretty opaque. So, um, so what we're going to do is hope that there's some ground in between where we can get sort of as much accuracy as possible while not losing too much intelligibility. So if we have this space that goes from sort of very simple linear models to these full complexity models, there's uh, something in the middle called additive models, which many of you may have heard of. So and what additive models are, instead of there being a weight times a feature plus a weight times a feature, there's a function of this feature. And that function can be a pretty complex nonlinear function, but it's still functions of individual features. There's no function here that's a function of all the features. It's just individual functions of individual features, which are then being added together, just like they would be in a logistic regression model. We can make that a little more complicated. Uh, this sum over functions of individual features is this part of the model. And now we've added a sum over functions of pairs of features. So this would capture things like pairwise interactions between features. Uh, and then this would capture, uh, say, three-way interactions between features. And if we, uh, if we have n features and we go all the way up to n-way interactions, then pretty much anything can be represented by this model class. Now, what we're going to do, though, is we're not going to allow ourselves to even go to three-way interactions. We're going to stop with uh, functions of individual features, this term. And we're going to allow ourselves a small number of functions of pairs of features. And we're going to see what we can do with that. And the reason why we're going to stick to this model class is, I think, as I'll be able to, to demonstrate to you, these remain pretty intelligible. Uh, they're pretty easy to understand. Uh, and if we succeed and get pretty good accuracy out of these things, and they remain intelligible, then, then we've sort of accomplished our goal. OK. I didn't invent uh, generalized additive models. In fact, there's a very nice book by Tip Shirani uh, and Hasty back in 1990, uh, uh, which beautifully goes through, through this class of models. So statisticians have been here long, long before us. So uh, what we're going to be doing is using this class of functions, and then we're going to put it on sort of machine learning steroids. So, so we're going to do this class as best we can. Um, so let, let me talk a little bit about the shaping uh, that's going to be an important part of, of the learning process here. Imagine features like body temperature, uh, respiration rate, uh, pulse rate, things like that. Uh, partial pressure of oxygen in your blood. Um, a number of these variables, like body temperature, there's a normal range, 37C. And then if you're much higher than 37C, you have a fever, and you're presumably at high risk because you have a high fever. Or you could be much colder than 37C, maybe 32C. And that also would put you at higher risk because you're hypothermic. Now, clearly, a linear model like logistic regression can't handle this with a single feature for body temperature because there's no way to multiply temperature and have it be low in the middle and high at both ends. right? So, so what do you typically do when you do logistic regression is you end up taking temperature and breaking it into multiple variables. So you have a, uh, a fever variable, which uh, starts at 37C. And you know, so it's zero when you're normal. And as your fever gets higher, that number gets higher. And then you have a hypothermic variable, which uh, also starts at zero uh, for normal temperature. And then as your temperature goes down, it sort of gets higher, indicating you have more hypothermia. 
And then uh, you do logistic regression on these multiple variables. And what happens is uh, only one of, you'll, you'll either be hypothermic or you'll have fever. You won't have both. So only one of these will apply. And then you'll have a weight times this. So even that doesn't work well enough. And that's because your sort of risk with fever goes up rapidly. It, you know, it's almost like an exponential rise. Uh, so you actually need to create sort of low fever, medium fever, high fever, very high fever. You, you need to create these multiple variables so that you can have different weights on these different terms. So and that's typically what's done. And you, you use experts. Uh, we use doctors you know, to say what these different ranges should be when we take a temperature variable and we break it into a dozen variables, which we're going to do logistic regression on. We use expertise to do that. Now, the expertise does, does end up hurting intelligibility a little bit. What was a single variable is now you know, maybe half a dozen or a dozen variables. Uh, and it also requires expertise to do this. And maybe the expertise isn't perfect. Maybe it's not done as well as you could do it if you learned it from data. Um, so and this is the pneumonia data set that we're going to spend some time talking about. And some of these variables, you can actually see how they've been discretized. So, uh, let's see, heart rate, it looks like less than 125 is normal, 125 to 150 is considered high, this is considered very high. Systolic blood pressure, less than 60, 61 to 70, 71 to 80, 81 to 90, greater than 91 is considered normal. Here, here's temperature, you can see it's broken into you know, half a dozen different variables. So this is the way things would normally be done, and in fact the logistic regression model for pneumonia, this is exactly how it was done. These variables were broken up into these different uh, quantile you know, ranges, uh, and then logistic regression was done on these, these variables. So that's the way you would normally do it. Whoops, sorry. Let me go back one. So what we're going to do, though, is we're going to be able, with these generalized additive models, of doing a more complex shaping function. So let me just give you some example. This is just synthetic data here. Um, imagine we had a, a problem with six features. And let's say everything truly is linear on each of the features. So, so ignore the graph for now. Just imagine it truly is a linear function of these six different features. And if you learn the right coefficients, you'll get zero error on the data. Now imagine that unbeknownst to you, I go in and I take all the values of, of x2 and I do like a square transformation to them or a square root transformation to them. And I, I go to another variable and I do a sine or cosine transformation to it. So I, I do this. I play with the data. Okay, I transform it. Now, obviously, if you're trying to train a linear model, you won't be able to get you know, zero error. In fact, a linear model of data that's been transformed in these ways, you get a pretty high residual, residual error. But if you're able to learn functions that capture the transformation and undo it, do the inverse transformation, you'll convert things back to the original linear space. And then when you fit a linear function, you'll actually do extremely well. Right? And, and, and that's what happens. You get to, either the better you can do that, the better you get back to zero error. So that's the kind of game we're going to play. The only difference is it's not going to be contrived in this way. It's not like I'll have done some transformations to the data and you play the game of trying to figure out what I did and undo it. Instead, we'll have no idea what the real transformations are and the model's just going to have to learn it from the data. So that's what we're going to do. So this is, uh, this is my computer science slide. Um, I'm just going to sketch the algorithm that we're going to use so that you have an idea. But we're really not going to talk about the details under the hood any more than this. Because it's more important, I think, to show you what we can do with the model. So the first stage is we're going to build the most accurate additive model we can where we just shape individual features. So this is no interactions. We're just shaping individual features. We're going to do that under the hood. We're using boosted decision trees. The decision trees are, are controlled so that they can only, each tree can only look at a single feature. That way it can't do any interactions of features by testing multiple features in the same tree. So we might have you know, hundreds of thousands of trees, but every tree is only allowed to examine a single feature at a time. So if we want to look at different features, there will have to be different trees that do that. So if we do this really well, and then you subtract from the targets that you're trying to predict, Everything that's in the residual is either noise or it's something that depends on features you just don't have measured, which you'll never be able to model. So that's kind of like noise. Or it's some sort of interaction. It's either a pairwise interaction or a three-way interaction or something like that. So what we do is we do this as well as we can. Uh, then we look at the residual, and we have a technique that we've published, which is a very fast mechanism for scanning for pairwise interactions. 
So, and there can be a lot. In one of the data sets, we're going to have 4,000 features. That's 4,000 squared over two, right? So I guess that's, what, 8 million pairs of features. And what we're going to look for is just sort of the top 250 most important pairwise interactions. But there's 8 million things we have to test. So it has to be done quickly. It's a large data set. So we have a fast method for doing this. Then we'll take the top, you know, 100, 200, 300 pairs. And we'll just use cross-validation to pick the top n. And then we'll do the same sort of shaping on those pairs. And we'll add that to the model. And then we'll adjust the whole model a bit, and then we're done. OK, so that's, don't worry about the details. Uh, it doesn't really matter that much. There are papers that would, would show you how to do this in, if you want to write your own code. Um, and then we're going to repeat the process you know, 10 or 100 times. And that's to further reduce the variance of the process, because it can be a high variance process. And also because we want something that's like a confidence interval. So this will give us pseudo, pseudo confidence intervals. They're not very trustworthy confidence intervals, but, but they'll, they'll work reasonably well. So that's the algorithm slide. Let me tell you about the data. We'll, we'll spend some time with this pneumonia data set from the mid-90s. Uh, it's a mod it was a pretty big data set back then, about 15,000 patients. We only had 46 features. All the patients have pneumonia. And the goal is to predict probability of death. So in about 11% of the patients do die from, from pneumonia. The larger data set that we'll look at is a very recent data set. Here we've got 100,000 patients a year from a major urban hospital. Um, and the goal here is completely different. We're not predicting probability of death at all. You've all been in the hospital. Uh, you've just been released. And our goal is to predict if you might need to come back to the hospital within 30 days. And in the US, they're starting to penalize hospitals where too many patients have to come back within 30 days. Because presumably, you didn't do something you know, right if too large a percentage of your patients have to bounce back in 30 days. So, so this sort of puts the pressure on hospitals to either not release the patient if they shouldn't be released, or to ensure that they have uh, proper care during the time after they're released, or that they know how to take their meds and, and things like that. So, OK, so those are the two different data sets. Um, just give you an idea, uh, this isn't that important. On the pneumonia data set, these are ROCs. On the pneumonia data set, the GA2M model, this is our generalized additive models with pairs, is, is doing pretty well. It's a pretty good ROC. Um, it's better than the neural net that I trained back in the mid-90s. So this, this is a high accuracy model. Even logistic regression, if we do it well, does OK on this if we discretize the variables in, into the proper bins. So we're doing better than logistic regression. But the difference is not astoundingly large. On the other pneumonia data set we have, which is much smaller, um, it turns out the difference between logistic regression and any full complexity model is huge. It's 10 points of ROC. Um, and then on this readmission data set, uh, we do a couple points better in ROC than, than the simple models like logistic regression. So. So, uh, and I just want to, so we're talking about shaping features. You can only really shape a feature that's, you know, got multiple values. If it's a Boolean feature, there's no interesting shaping to do. In fact, if it's a Boolean feature, our method is just logistic regression. So it's just putting a weight on the feature. I'll show it as a graph, but it is just logis logistic regression. So it's only the features that are labeled with a C here for continuous that we're actually going to do some shaping. Okay. Whoops. So now we're actually looking at a term. This is the term for age. This is the pneumonia data set. We're trying to predict probability of death. And I'm going to show you a number of these graphs. So let's spend a little time with this graph so you get comfortable with it. So this is, and this is completely learned from the data. There is no human expertise fed into this model. So it's, it's got 46 features. This is what it learns for one of the features. Uh, so this is age on the x-axis. This is a data set that has just adults. So there's nobody younger than 18 in the data set. Uh, the risk here, this is a value that the model's predicting for different age. So the way to read this would be if you're age 70, then it adds a 0 to your risk. If you're age 80, it adds about a 0.17 to your risk. If you're age 50, it subtracts about a 0.25 from your risk. And the way the risk works is, uh, Roughly speaking, if you add 1 to your risk, it kind of doubles your probability. It's like log odds. It kind of doubles your chances of death. And if we subtract 1 from your risk, it kind of cuts your probability of death in half, so roughly speaking. Yeah? When you're taking someone through the decision tree, with these tests are just like thresholds. Is that right? Right. In fact, it's, uh, it's an ensemble of thousands of decision trees, 
all of which are shaping just the age variable. And then this is the aggregate of that ensemble of thousands of trees. But if you think of it as a single tree, it's kind of right. This is just smoother because it's an average of thousands of them. Yes? You can assume this is coming from the forest. Yes, yes, exactly. But I guess if you wanted to put other kinds of smoothness priors on that shaping function, it'd be, it, it'd be difficult. It, in fact, it's one of the things we're looking at, is having a little bit more explicit control over the smoothness, as opposed to it just being an artifact of the learning method. Yeah, yeah. No, I think your intuition is exactly right, that controlling smoothness is important. If you just did a normal thing and bin up, yes. then that's like a piecewise constant approximation to the shaping. Right. And, and if, if you, you made the bins fine enough, of course, it would look a lot like this. What if you interpolate instead? Uh, so and we have thought about interpolating. Yeah. yeah. Well, we haven't done it so far. But we are thinking about different ways of imposing smoothing, further smoothing onto, onto these graphs. Yes. Yeah. Sure. The error bars, they come about, they're much smaller in the 70s and 80s. Is that because you've got many more patients? Than that? Yes, yes. In, in fact, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have said this is a histogram. This is the density of patients of different ages in the bottom. And you can see the error bars tend to be smallest where we have the largest sample size. Yeah, so you're, you're exactly right. Yeah. And the error bars, you know, they're coming from our bagging process. So, you, you know, these are, these are not statistically valid error bars. They're just sort of to give us a qualitative idea of what's going on here. So, uh, so you should scoff at our error bars. <laughs> um, OK, so, so let, let's look at the graph and see what it says. So well, it's good to be young. Uh, so it's very nice to be under, say, 50. Um, so that lowers your risk. And in fact, it doesn't seem to distinguish between patients who are 45 and patients who are 35 and 25. It just, it just seems to consider them all to be uniformly low, low risk of dying of pneumonia if they have pneumonia. Then risk seems to rise slowly as we go from sort of 50 to, say, 65. Uh, so that, that, that's nice. There's an interesting jump at around 67, uh, 66, 67. And it's interesting, in, especially in the mid-90s, this would have been retirement age uh, in the US for the majority of the population. So in retirement, not only means that you know, your daily schedule has changed, your activities have changed, but it also means your healthcare provider has probably changed. I, I mean, you're, you're now on Medicaid, Medicare, as a opposed to receiving insurance perhaps through a company. So a lot of things have changed at that point, and it's interesting that the model seems to detect that. Remember, it doesn't know anything about this. It's just looking at the data uh, for 15,000 patients and coming up with this. Um, so maybe it has detected retirement age, and then risk seems to rise pretty rapidly as we grow older than, than say, upper 60s into the 80s. There's another interesting jump at exactly the 85, 86 boundary, um, there's, nothing, there's nothing explicit that happens in healthcare in the US at age 85. And there's a chance, we're not sure yet, what causes this. And, and this is where a causal interpretation of the data would be so valuable if, if we had it. An interesting question is, well, there is a sort of thought that uh, you know, doctors sort of say, well, you know, grandpa is, is 87. It's uh, got pneumonia, hasn't responded to the first two rounds of antibiotics. Do we really, is it really in grandpa's best interest for us to continue aggressive treatment? So there's a chance that it's a purely social, psychological, unconscious decision that's happening, basically for patients who are over some round number threshold, like 85 uh, in the US. Uh, but, but we don't actually know. Uh, if, if that's real. So, so that's something we have to further investigate. It's something the model, when it makes predictions, does do. So this is an accurate statement of what the model does. Now, whether it's doing this correctly or incorrectly is the thing that we don't know. So, uh, and then risk seems to flatten off, and then it maybe drops. Now, the error bars are getting large out here. There's very few samples out here uh, at, at this age. And I showed this to some doctors for the first time a couple weeks ago, and they said, are you familiar with the class of people called successful agers. And apparently, this is a genetically identifiable class. There are markers that indicate you're, in, you're lucky enough to be in the successful agers. And they said they wonder if this is a successful ager showing up in the graph. Very little sample size. You know, I, I wouldn't want to bet my life on that. So, but, but it's interesting that right away when, when we showed this to doctors, they said, you know, there's a possible explanation for why that happens. So. Uh, they also thought this was very interesting because I think they were all 
feeling a little guilty that <laughs> maybe they were unconsciously causing this uh, small increase in risk for patients above some threshold for which they really had no medical justification for, for doing. Um, they also sort of laughed at this and they said, you know, causally it could be that uh, we just know how to set retirement at the right, that this is natural, <laughs> and we just know where to put retirement age. <laughs> so, okay, so this is just learned from the data. Um, and what I wanna emphasize is, here we are, we've trained a model that's as accurate as any other model we know how to use in this data. It's as accurate as boosted trees, neural nets, all those sorts of things. In fact, it's more accurate than some of those methods. And all of a sudden, we're having an interesting conversation about very specifically what the model has learned about one of the variables, age. And we're even sort of generating questions like, oh, I can sort of understand that. I wonder if that's real. And if it's real, why is that happening? Boy, that looks dubious. Let's look into it. It's really, really interesting that we're having this conversation. If this had been a neural net or random forest, we would have said, well, the ROC is 0.86. Let's use it. <laughs> uh, and we wouldn't really know. That presumably, those other models would be doing something vaguely like this inside. Uh, but we just wouldn't know that it was inside. It's because these models, these terms are sort of independent uh, and examinable as graphs that we're able to have this sort of interesting discussion and, and peek at what the model's doing. I'll get there in a second. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you feel that we could have just like, fed the neural net at a bunch of data where we tile the space? and then kind of done analysis and recovered this graph from the neural net? There, there's no doubt that with enough effort, we could probably get this back out of the neural net. It's not easy, though. In the neural net, it's really entangled with all the other variables in a way that's hard. Like, you might think you can just marginalize over all the other variables, say, in the neural net or even in the data without having learned the model. Maybe you just do marginalization over everything else, and this graph pops out. And it turns out that's not the case. You, you don't get this graph if you marginalize over all the other variables. You have to learn all the terms together uh, in order to get this, this sort of graph. So marginalization alone doesn't do it. But clearly, it's in the neural net. And with enough effort, we could find out. The best way I know right now for learning it, if it's in the neural net, is to train this model to mimic the neural net <laughs> and then look at this model. But I mean, that's not a very good answer. But I'm sure it's in the neural net. And one way or another, we could tease it out. Yeah. The, the beauty of this is there isn't anything. This is the model. Like The way this model works is you really do find the patient's age. You go up on the graph. Whatever that value is, you write it down. You do that for all 46 terms. You add up the column of numbers, convert to a probability in the usual way. And that is the model. There's, there's no extra complexity anywhere. Uh, so it's completely transparent. So. Um, it, yeah. So you said this was different than doing marginalization. Why is, why is it better to look at this than to look at the marginalization block? So the problem with the marginalization is uh, one of the things marginalization will do is it'll multiple count evidence um, from different variables. Uh, so these things are additive in the sense that if we have three variables, uh, we'll take the effect from this variable, the effect from the next variable, and, and add them together. And then that gives us the probability. Marginalization could easily show us that for each of those variables, you would predict that same total probability, like you would get the same risk score from doing the marginalization. Uh, whoops, I'm sorry. Well, I agree that it would, be, it would not be, it would not map onto the model. But I'm saying that. That's interesting. Uh, uh, agree, go ahead. It doesn't map onto the model anymore, but I'm saying that all, all, the, all the, the conclusions and deductions you were making about that plot could be made from the marginal plot, right? Uh, what would happen is the marginal plot would have vaguely similar structure, right? I mean, for, especially for a variable like age, the marginal plot will recognize that you know, risk is higher for higher age and lo lo lower here. It'll be a little messier because the effect of other confounding variables haven't been subtracted so carefully. But, but it'll still be qualitatively somewhat similar. The difference, though, is you don't actually know exactly what impact it has on the model the marginalization, because you'll be multiple counting the evidence uh, from all these terms. So if you, were to, if you were to do this, predict the risk score, and then add them all up, you'll end up with either much higher or much lower risk from the marginalization than this, which is constrained to making sure that these things all add up properly to the right probability. So, but I agree, in some cases, marginalization actually can, can give you qualitatively similar results. It's not the model, though. Marginalization 
I guess, I guess my question comes down to what are you using this graph for then? The uh, let's see. So the graph is the model. So, so the model, the, the model, uh, let's see. So, so what I've done is I've trained a model that predicts accurate probabilities. It's as accurate as any other model we know how to train. And you can completely understand the model, right? There's, there's nothing hidden here. Um, if you disagree with... But, but the purpose of intelligibility, as you said, was to elicit some causal understanding from the... No, 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 no. The, the purpose of the intelligibility is not... Oh, oh, let's see. But to get the expert to comment on whether... They yes, do. yes, yes. It's, it's definitely to allow the expert to bless the model and to basically say, we, we trust that this looks reasonable or this looks very wrong. Yes, yes, it's definitely to do that. And we wouldn't necessarily get the same thing from the marginalization, right? Because the marginalization wouldn't be the, making the same predictions uh, as this model. I mean, the marginalization is not itself a predictive model. It's, it's a tool for looking at data. Whereas this actually is a model. I guess I'm not, I'm not clear on why this is actually more intelligible because there could be other correlated features. In fact, there probably are other correlated uh, and, and they're features. definitely, and so if I just look at this, it doesn't really right. tell me what's gonna happen. Uh, Correlation is definitely the curse uh, of all high dimensional data. And it'll be a curse here as well, just as it's a curse in logistic regression, right? Logistic regression also becomes difficult in a thousand dimensional space. Uh, I mean, all I can say is we have an accurate model. It's as accurate as anything else we could train. And this model, unlike anything else we know how to train that's this accurate, you can actually understand exactly where the prediction comes from. And because of that, you have a chance of deciding that some of what it's doing is not correct. And I'll show you examples of places where it's sort of obvious it's, it's doing the wrong thing. But, but I'm not sure how to say more than that. So It's definitely not causal itself. Uh, and it's, in fact, it's one of the concerns we have is that the model is so intelligible that we're afraid, the healthcare professionals I've shown it to recently, they often leap to a causal interpretation, and we sort of have to keep reminding them, sorry, it's not that smart. It's, it's, it's not causal. It's interesting if it suggests causal things that you want us to study, but, but the model itself is not, not causal, not necessarily. So. Okay, so this is age. Let's, let's go on. So statisticians, right, generalized additive models have been around a long time. The reason why we're getting extra horsepower out of them is because we're doing all the tricks that machine learning people do. Statisticians, if they had uh, worked on this feature, what they would have done is fitted it with a linear model. Um, so this is, is popular code, where they would have done a spline fit, a linear model. And <coughs> they would basically say that you know, the risk sort of just increases with age. So, so they would have missed a lot of this detail. Um, so, and I think this is an example of just statisticians being very conservative when they fit a model. Um, statisticians don't like to add a term to their model if they're not sort of 95% or more confident that that term really needs to be there in that shape. And I think you can't make a statement that this graph is correct, like to some 95% confidence interval. We, we don't know how to do that. Now, not everything is so rosy. So this is a blood pH. Again, we're doing pneumonia risk. Um, and normal blood pH is sort of around this range. And it's interesting that it sort of drops here and then goes up and then drops again further. And I've asked the, the doctors about this. And they said one possible explanation for why it's low here and then goes up and then comes back down is there might actually be a threshold where they start applying treatment at this point. Um, so, so it's sort of like you know, you're fine if you're here, and then your pH is going higher, you're getting higher risk, but they haven't applied the treatment yet. Then they suddenly apply the treatment, and it helps you, and it lowers your pH. So that's one possible interpretation. But the truth is, it's just a pretty messy looking graph, right? It's not, it's not beautiful and clean like that age graph might have been. I don't really know how much of the detail and structure that's on that graph is real, uh, meaning a sort of accurate statement about the data. I don't necessarily mean causally real. Um, now, statisticians would have fitted, you know, with this particular spline, and that's actually perhaps too simple. It also misses sort of interesting detail that's being captured over here. 
But you know, I don't really love this graph either. I've intentionally picked one of the bad graphs from, from the model. And you, you know, I don't really, really love that one. I, I don't like that one either. I'd like to have something probably in between, which is why we're talking about ways of imposing better regularization. But you know, if statisticians are too conservative, machine learning people tend to be too high variance, right? So, um, and here's, here's sort of my joke about that, which is, uh, so, so statisticians you know, approach the edge of the precipice very, very cautiously. And a 95% a confidence interval kind of prevents them from ever getting to the edge, right? Because they're, they're so careful. Uh, so, so they end up sort of stuck here. And because of that, they don't get all the accuracy that they might have gotten by including more terms in their model. Uh, now, machine learning people were the opposite. We're like lemmings. We just run you know, headlong, full speed at the edge, jump off. And then we count on something like cross-validation maybe to save us before we crash and burn at the bottom. But the ideal place to be would be, you know, the best view is right at the edge of the cliff. And uh, I think something in between uh, what statisticians have been doing and the sort of overly complex models we're training is actually ideal. And, and then we're trying to sort of pull ourselves back to, to get there. But we're, we're not there yet. So, OK, so that's my joke about machine learning people versus statisticians. This is another graph for age, but this is now the model that's 30-day readmission. Okay, so this is uh, bounce back, hospital bounce back. There's uh, ignore for now, we have patients now that are under age 18 uh, for this data set. Ignore that for now. We have something qualitatively similar. We have pretty flat risk sort of in 20s, 30s uh, to mid 40s. Then risk goes up somewhat slowly as you, you, you know, start hitting 50s uh, and 60s. Again, we see this sort of interesting jump. Uh, here it's delayed by a year or two. And what's interesting is that's probably true in the US now, since this is a modern data set, that retirement age has sort of moved an extra year or two, two later. We see a sort of another jump. There's this interesting drop that I don't know what to make of that. And then we do start to see some interesting jumps uh, it's not exactly the same uh, as the other graph. Now, it's a very different prediction test. The other were prediction probability of death. This is just, you know, maybe you had a car accident and you had your bones fixed and, you know, do you need to come back in 30 days? So, so this is a very different task. There's some similarity between the graph. There's some differences between the graphs. Um, one of the big differences is uh, the vertical range is quite different. There are now 4,000 features in this data set, and age is not one of the most powerful features anymore, whereas for pneumonia, it's a very powerful feature. Um, so, so the range of, uh, of score predictions that comes from age is, is much smaller than the other, the other model. And then there's this interesting detail that's happening here near zero. And let me just zoom in on that and show you what, what's happening. So now we're just looking at age zero to two years, because uh, now we have infants. In, in fact, if you're a newborn, you're born into the hospital, uh, so you are a patient. And then the question is, would you need to return within 30 days? And it's interesting. This is the largest uh, difference from zero prediction, this minus 0.05. It basically says most infants are born healthy into the hospital and will not need to return to the hospital within 30 days. Uh, and that seems to match the doctor's understanding. And then they also thought this was very interesting, that the risk is slightly elevated once you sort of hit the three-month to one to two-year period, which is where a lot of sort of infant uh, conditions are detected and need to be treated. So, so they found this sort of interesting. And the only way you end up coming back here is if you were in the hospital one month earlier. So, so this is, again, 30-day readmission. It's not readmission from this point. It's, it's readmission within a one-month period. And then a risk sort of drops. Uh, and you're usually pretty healthy, it looks like, until you know, 18, 20, 30, and starting to get into your 40s. So again, it's sort of interesting that the model has learned this kind of detail uh, about age uh, from the data set. So, so, and that's kind of nice uh, that we're able to see this. It's not um, really to do with birth. It goes up the first two months. Uh, so, so, if you're born, uh, and this is 30-day readmission, then basically you'd have to be readmitted within this small window of, a, of one month. Um, to be readmitted at uh, three months, you'd have to have been in the hospital for some reason at two months or, or less. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope I answered your question. So. Um, so it's just interesting that the model is learning this sort of detail, that we're, we tend to be born healthy, that there is a period in childhood where, where we do s tend to have some illness, uh, and then we sort of come back to the normal long period of health of, of youth and middle age, uh, and then things get worse. 
Um, so I think everybody in the room knows about parity and interaction. So let me just jump and show you an interaction. And it's sort of a sad one. This is, uh, this is the pneumonia data set again. So now before we were looking at graphs, that's because we were shaping individual features. Now we're shaping a pair of features. And in this case, we're shaping this pair. Uh, on this axis, we have cancer. And on this axis, we have age. And the uh, cancer is just a Boolean, so it's just zero or one. So no cancer has cancer. And then this is the usual age, which goes from 18 to 100 in this data set. Um, and the other factor for age is already in the model, that graph that we saw. And there's a factor for cancer, which is in the model, uh, which I haven't shown you. This is the interaction between the two. It's what could not be captured by, by, by those uh, individual terms. And it's kind of interesting. The reason why it's an interaction is we have sort of high, high risk here, high risk here, lower risk here, lower risk here. That's the classic parity diagonal effect. Um, and what's particularly striking is the high risk uh, at low age if you have cancer. Uh, and it turns out, we've, we've looked into this a little bit to try to understand it, it turns out what we're seeing is uh, childhood cancers, youth, cancers of youth, uh, leukemias and things like that, which sadly, for the most part, have not responded to treatment. So you still have them as you're going into age 18, 20, 22. And not only do you still have them, but you have pneumonia now. You wouldn't be in the data set if you didn't have pneumonia. So it means you've had a childhood cancer, you're probably, not, not all patients have had a childhood cancer, but probably most of them. Uh, you're now 18, 20, 22 years old, you have pneumonia, and it means that the cancer has not responded to treatment uh, in youth, and that's sort of a sign that you're at high risk. So what we're seeing is the tail of the distribution of children, which are not in this data set, who have made it to, to youth past their teens, um, and sadly have not responded, they're still diagnosed as having cancer. Whereas if you had had cancer at age 14, received two years of treatment, and were considered cured, you wouldn't still have it in this data set. Um, so, so it's sort of sad that that's what we're seeing. Um, yeah. Okay. So let me actually just go to uh, one of these models, and, uh, and then we're just going to... Let's see. Okay, so this is the model for pneumonia. This is age that we were looking at. And what I want to do is I want to scroll down to asthma. Okay. Uh, remember, this whole thing started for me with the asthma problem in a neural net. And it turns out that the model does learn asthma is a Boolean. It learns that uh, having asthma lowers risk. So the model has learned exactly what we learned back in the mid-90s. And that's why we didn't ship the neural net. Uh, was because of asthma. So it has learned the same thing. So how would we deal with it? The interesting thing is, the way we would deal with it is, if you think asthma is a problem, which it obviously is, you want there to be a variable, which is asthma, in the model. The last thing you should do is hide it or take it away. You want it to learn as much as it can on top of that asthma variable, and then you just cross it out in the model. You sort of set its weight to zero. And do not retrain the model. If you retrain the model, then correlation will kill you. And what will happen is the asthma effect will spread as much as it can through the other correlated variables. And you won't even know it's there. So, so you don't want that to happen. So you want there to be an asthma variable. You want it to learn about asthma. You want to then recognize that what it's learned is wrong. And you want to either just put a zero, which is the, like eliminating the rule, or uh, if you wanted, uh, an expert could say, no, I want asthmatics to be very high risk. I want this to go from zero if you don't have asthma. I want it to go to plus 10. Re redraw the graph that way. And, and it'll all work. The, the model will work if you do that. So you can either edit the models by changing the graphs. It would take a lot of expertise to change some of these graphs, like the age graph. Or you can just eliminate an effect. And here's the interesting thing. So there's asthma. So this model, I was very happy to see that this model was as you know, bad or smart as the model before. Here's something interesting. History of chest pain. Turns out that's also a good thing to have if you have pneumonia. Uh, and we think it's exactly the same effect. And we never learned a rule uh, that said this. So this is something that presumably was in the model we didn't know about. This is an even stronger effect than asthma. Uh, so it's interesting that the rule-based learning didn't 
didn't learn it. So again, we would probably just eliminate this factor. Just, just like this is what they did in logistic regression. So when they, actually they did something less correct than this. In logistic regression, they removed the variable asthma uh, and then did logistic regression without it, which meant that the leakage through correlated variables probably happened. It would have been better if they left the variable in and then set its weight to zero, as, as we would suggest doing. But there's more. So, Chronic lung disease also seems to be a good thing, and we think this, this is exactly the same effect. So, so all three of these terms, we would probably just eliminate them from the model. So, so this is the kind of thing where being able to quickly look at the terms is very valuable. Um, I'll just find one or two more interesting things here, then I'll go to a different model, and then that'll be it. Uh, oh, it's a really good question. Uh, we would probably throw away its interactions as well, because we're scared of it. Yes, although it's a little darker when we start throwing away interactions. It's, it's a very good question. We need to do more research on that. Yeah. But we sort of have a model right now that things are, if, if they look tainted, we tend to eliminate the whole thing. Um, this is just sort of interesting. Yeah, I knew this data set pretty well uh, 15 years ago. Uh, it turns out there's this incredibly flat spot for a heart rate that's kind of normal. And as soon as I saw this graph, I thought, oh, my code is broken. You know, so, something's not working. I looked at the data. It turns out there are no patients in this range. All patients who had, quote, normal heart rate, which is a pretty wide range, were just coded as zero, which is common, especially in older medical data sets. Um, so there's actually no patients here. So one, it points out a weakness of the current model, which is, I mean, there's no patients here, so it's not really making a prediction for anybody. But if a patient did fall here in the normal range, it would predict a plus 0.2 for them. And I'd really rather have predicted a zero for them uh, if they fell there. But what was interesting is by seeing this graph, I just sort of instantly knew there was something funky going on that I didn't understand. And it only took me a minute to then realize that there was this property in the data that I had never realized before. So, so this turns out to be a very valuable tool for understanding the data. OK, so now I want to show you one other thing. And then we're actually done. Um, OK, so now I'm going to jump to, we, we've been looking at the models overall, trying to understand the entire graph and all of the models. Let's now look at the models for some specific patients. And now we're going to look at 30-day readmission. OK, so we've got hundreds of thousands of patients and uh, 4,000 different terms. So here's a patient. Their uh, probability of readmission is 0.08. It turns out that's about baseline. On average, about 8 9% of the patients readmit. Why does it, what we've done is we've sorted all the terms. There's 4,000 plus terms in the model. We've sorted all the terms by how much they contribute to increasing your risk, and at the bottom by how much they contribute to decreasing your risk. So we're just going to look at the highest risk terms. I'm not going to show you 4,000 terms. We're just going to look at the top five or, or 10. So why does it think this patient is, you know, what, what increases the risk for this patient? Well, they've been in the hospital six times before. That's a fairly large number. So, so that's interesting. So that adds something to their risk. Um, it turns out electrolyte imbalance is, is something that's not great. It does increase your risk a little bit. Um, it turns out they've been in the ER also six times, which is different from being an inpatient six times. It turns out they have combat fatigue. Um, and they have a drug intoxication. So they have a drug problem. Um, so, now think about this. Here's a patient, 4,200 terms for this patient. And we've just sort of looked at five or six of them. And I think pretty quickly we've identified what are likely to be the most important factors for this patient being at risk right now of coming back to the hospital. So, so I think it's interesting that by looking at the terms sort of this way, and this is a standard trick in logistic regression. You look at the terms that increase risk the most and decrease risk the most. But because we get to see graphs, it's, it's just a sort of richer, uh, a richer thing to do. And I'll show you uh, two more graphs, and then we'll just stop. Um, here's a very high risk patient. Uh, so this patient has a 92% chance of returning to the hospital uh, in 30 days. So why? Fat intravenous preparations. So they're trying to get food into this person intravenously as much as they can. Uh, and it's a very high score. This is adding 0.44 to their risk. Just that one factor is adding, adding that much to their risk. 
They have, sadly, cyclical vomiting syndrome. This is something that young children have, sort of age one to three. Uh, so they're having problems keeping food down. And they have a particularly high risk value of it. Uh, so and it's adding that much to their score. Um, and they're receiving, I've looked up these things, they're receiving preparations to help prevent nausea and to try to keep food down. So they're trying to treat this, this patient. Um, the patient, <laughs> they've been in the hospital, they're, they're young it turns out, they've been in the hospital 64 times. Okay, so they've been in an amazing number of times. So of course that increases the risk all by itself. And if you look at the next graph, uh, they've been in the hospital um, what, uh, 18 times in the last 12 months. So their average time between return is less than 30 days. So of course the probability of returning within 30 days is, is gonna be high. Um, okay, so I think, I think that's it for looking at these models. We can look at, you know, here's a patient who's also very high risk. They're very high risk because they're receiving abnormally high doses of chemotherapy agents. And the only way it turns out to receive those very high doses of chemotherapy agents and agents with, which help you tolerate chemotherapy, the only way to do that is if you're sort of receiving a second and third round of chemotherapy, that, that you're not responding to treatment. Okay, so let me just go back and wrap up. So, so that's, I think, I think you can see, by just looking at sort of the top 10 terms, we're able to get you know, a pretty quick summary of what's happening with this patient that's relevant for the prediction task for 30-day for readmission. It's kind of like you know, two doctors walking up to each other and saying, ah, good chance this patient's coming back. They've got this, 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 and this. So, so it's kind of like that story. Despite the fact that there's over 4,000 terms in the model, we've only looked at a few of them, and we feel like we have you know, maybe some understanding of what's going on with this patient. The vast majority of terms for the vast majority of patients are in that sort of long tail in the middle which have sort of very little consequence because they don't really apply to most patients. So, okay, so let's, uh, let's just summarize. Um, we're getting remarkably high accuracy on, on our healthcare problems with this, this method. Uh, higher accuracy than we ever expected to get, in fact. Um, and that's because logistic regression itself is not so bad on some of these problems, um, especially if you shape the features you know, with expertise. Um, we think the terms are reasonably understandable, intelligible, transparent. I don't know what the right word is. They're definitely not causal, though. Uh, in some cases, they probably are causal, but it would always require a lot of extra work or expertise to be able to validate whether what we're seeing on the graphs is, is causal. Um, I'm very happy that on the pneumonia data set, it rediscovered the problem that made us worry uh, 20 years ago. And it's kind of nice that it discovered new things that look just like that problem. So we were actually you know, probably justified in being worried about releasing that model. So, so that's great. Um, and I'll just jump. There's a lot of work to do. Uh, it's, this is an interesting class of models also for engineering, because if you're doing machine learning as part of your product, it's important sometimes to understand why the model works, <laughs> what it's doing inside, so that you can then better uh, uh, better improve the model the next month. Uh, I know one of my co-authors used this uh, for a problem, and uh, within a day they discovered a problem in the data set that they didn't know about, just because it learned something that seemed completely wrong. They investigated, it turned out there was a very important feature that was broken in the data set. So it's kind of nice to be able to see your model and understand what it's doing. It can be valuable in a lot of ways. But we need to do all sorts of things like user studies before we release this in the wild and you know, assume it works. I'm particularly concerned about people trusting the model too much and interpreting it as being causally correct because it, it's, it's not. If we were to just delete some of the terms and retrain the model, everything is gonna shift around. It's not like what it learned about age is correct about age. It's just that what it learned about age is exactly what it's doing its predictions based on. So you can see exactly how it's making its predictions. It's not that that's like the true graph for age that you would learn independent of all other features. So, so it shouldn't be interpreted that way. Um, okay, if you have any suggestions for how to do causal analysis of this, where to apply it, how to improve it, how to better regularize it, all those sorts of things. We're really in the early days with, with this. It's, it's a, it's, a, it's a new technique that we're just working on now. So we would love to get feedback, suggestions, criticisms, things like that. So th thank you for staying past time.
Thanks, Al.